Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Troubles and fears I took for my own. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Come on, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more light. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow. Just before the last service, uh, a person, a friend of ours from Kansas walked up to me and said, my parents were disciples, pastors, and he said, I remember when your mom came to general board and told us that her daughter was moving to Nashville and she was real nervous. <laughs> and I didn't know about that, so now I'm suddenly feeling a little nervous about my life choices. <laughs> Please rise with us and let's worship God together. We're going to sing a hymn that is really a prayer, right? So it's a plea. It's a plea for God to be close, to be near to you, all right? So we invite you to really open up your heart to what it is that God is leading you into, okay? And um, play, pray this plea with us, all right? I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus. Keep me from all
just a closer walk with thee. Granny, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord. Worshiping God together, getting a good sense of the holy in this place. Look around you, friends. The light of God is shining in the eyes of the people around you. Take a look around. Look at God's masterpieces. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your our living home, your presence, Lord. I tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come Shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Comfort this place and fill the atmosphere. Your Oh 
Disciples from far and wide to Beargrass Christian Church, we are so blessed by your presence here. Uh, I'm Trey Flowers, the senior minister here, and I'm honored to be preaching this morning. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, uh, but uh, no, we, uh, you will be blessed by worship today with uh, Dr. William Barber uh, preaching in just a moment. Uh, but I do want to say uh, on behalf of our entire congregation how grateful we are that uh, you are worshiping with us today and blessing us with your spirit. Uh, what an honor to have so many of our special guests here this morning. Uh, but all of you this morning are our are, are special guests here at Beargrass and we are one church family. And our prayer is that you feel at home during this time together, uh, that you feel at home to bring whatever uh, traditions and customs from your congregations, the, the beautiful diversity of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, there's a little bit about how we tend to do things here in that blue card in the seat pocket that says new here, uh, so you can read that and feel more at home during our time together today. Um, and uh, also, if you will open up that bulletin, and this is one of the best parts of worship right here. If you... Everybody get ready to tear off that side flap. Go ahead. Such a gratifying sound. <laughs> Fill out that connection card. Uh, if there's ways we can pray with you as a church family uh, or support you, we are here for you and we'll receive those in the offering plates later in the worship service. And I also want to say a huge thank you uh, to everyone who helped make today possible. Uh, our, our special musicians who are here joining our praise team and our choir. <laughs> And uh, in particular, thank you, Andrew, my uh, longtime colleague and friend. Uh, thank you for blessing us this morning. Uh, and uh, we will continue in a spirit of worship now for uh, one of the most joyful parts of worship each week when we invite our children to come forward for the children's moment. Uh, so children of all ages and stages, you're welcome to come on down this morning. Come join me. Good morning. I'm so glad to see so many of you. Keep on coming. Come on down. I feel like Bob Barker or Drew Carey, depending on your age. Come on down. <laughs> All right. If you want to come a little closer so you can see, that would be great. Come on up. We are so glad to welcome so many of you here. And this morning, we're thinking about what it means to be a church. And to help us think about that, I have brought us a book. And it's called This is the Church. And I know for some of you big kids out there, it might be hard to see as I'm reading. So thank you, God, for the wonders of technology. The pictures are going to appear on the screen as I share this wonderful book by Sarah Cunningham. Here we go. There's a little rhyme that children say, a song they sing sometimes when they play. 
This rhyme is about God's family. To do it, just move your hands like me. Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. A great rhyme. Isn't it neat? But wait! The story's not complete. There's more to the church than just those two lines. To learn about God's family, let's add to this rhyme. Some churches are so big and wide, 10,000 people can fit inside. Other churches are really quite small. They fit just a few people, and that is all. Some people have church right where they are, right in their houses. That's not very far. And not all churches have roofs and floors. Some don't have steeples. Some don't even have doors. Some people have church right under the stars. And God comes and meets them right where they are. And in places where it's not safe to be found, some people even have church underground. And church isn't something that stands still, you know. The church follows God's people wherever they go. The church moves in buses, planes, and cars. To share God's love, the church has gone far. The church works among the sick, hungry, and poor, with people in need wherever they are. It's gone to cities, it's gone to towns, to school and to work. The church, the church gets around. <laughs> but how does this work? How can this be? Can a church really move like you and like me? That's the secret. It certainly can. The church moves through your feet and works through your hands. The people are the church, don't you see? Church is a word for God's family. Because Jesus said, where two or three who gather in my name, that's where I'll be. So let's go back to the old rhyme now. Get your hands ready. We'll show you how. Here is the building. It may have a steeple. But where is the church? The church is the people. Say that with me, everybody. The church is the people. And that's something we're thinking about and celebrating today. Some of you go to church here every week. Some go to churches a lot of different places. But together, we are part of the kingdom of God. And when we work together as God's church, we can do lots and lots of things. And when we come together like we are with our brothers and sisters in Christ from all around the country, we can make God's love known in so many ways. So remember, the church is the people. And you guys, even though you may be young, you are still part of that church. And we count on you to help lead us and sharing God's love in this world. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for gathering us here today. Help us to remember that the church is the people, and that we are your children called to share your love in this world. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming up. You can head back to your parents, or if you're in preschool, we do have our nursery and child care available just down the hall. Thanks so much for coming up today. Well, church, church people, we're going to sing a little bit more together. We're singing a song in three parts, okay? So there's a low part, a middle part, and a high part. You get to self-select your part. How often is it that you get the freedom, right? Um, so we're going to teach you these three parts, and we're going to learn them quick because you, I can tell by looking at you, you're fast learners, okay? So here's the first one. 
What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Look at that. You already knew it. Right on. Middle voices. Or, yeah, middle voices. Wait, that was the middle part. Low part. Low part. You're singing this. Just as kindness walk humbly with your God. Beautiful. High voices, you get the shimmer. You're going to sing this. I'm going to try to sing this. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Here we go. To see justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. All right, God's people have rehearsed. Let God's people sing. Let's start off with our, our, uh, our middle voices. Here we go. Ready? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord have you with us today. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, uh, I want to share with you a tradition that we have at Beargrass, and that is any time a child is born, we light our Christ candle to honor that life and to welcome them into the world. But in the same spirit, any time someone's journey on earth ends, they enter into the life triumphant, we also light our Christ candle to honor that life. And our visitors you're about to see, we have had a very full week here at Beargrass. This morning, we light our Christ candle in honor of the one and only Clayton Ferris, Dr. Walden Lockhoff, better known as Scrap, and sweet Carolyn Walker. Three wonderful saints already missed by this church, by their families, by friends near and far. Would you join me now in a word of prayer? <coughs> Holy God, indeed we give you thanks for the beauty of this day and the enormity of this moment. Amidst the hustle and bustle of an assembly and travel and extra people in the room or on, the, on stream, we give you thanks for this moment of stillness, this time where we can set aside the chaos and the planning and the stress and the confusion and just be. Indeed, O oh God, of all the things you require of us, that is the first, that we simply be your child, created in your image, full of potential and life and love, and so we give you thanks. Indeed, O oh God, we do give you thanks for this weekend and all that is taking place, both here at Beargrass but also downtown. We thank you for our general church and all that is happening. And we thank you for the reunions uh, aplenty at a general assembly, the, the friendships renewed and deepened, the, the, the love shared across many miles and even more years. Thank you for this opportunity to gather. God, we thank you also for the, the business that we do, the work we conduct, 
We pray that your spirit reigns in us and guides all that we do and say, even especially when we disagree. But God, we also thank you that there's so much more going on than an assembly. And so we lift to you these three that have ended their journey on earth and have been enfolded into your love. Would you comfort us who mourn? In the days, weeks, and months, years ahead, oh God, may we recall them to life with grateful hearts. But we know, God, that it is not just these three that all of us come into worship this morning, yes, surrounded by the joy of this day, but also carrying our own burdens and losses. And so, O oh God, enfold each of us into your care as we open and surrender our hearts fully present for you. Speak to us words of assurance and grace. God, this weekend we are being challenged to consider your kingdom here on earth. And to be perfectly honest, we wrestle with why that's so difficult. Oh, sure, we, we know intellectually it's all yours. Each person, each life, each part of your creation is worthy of love and praise. And yet, oh God, we struggle to live that out and so forgive us forgive us God as we humbly come before you recognizing that there are far too many times that we're guided by things like pride where we insist on our way oh God silence our voices and open our ears that we would hear and see you in whoever it is we view as an opponent God forgive us as we step over someone in need in favor of our own comfortable lives or as we look with suspicion on someone who's hungry rather than offering them food. Forgive us for our poverty of spirit, O oh God, and call us to a new way of living. Forgive us for the ways that we seek to silence voices that make us uncomfortable challenge us instead oh God convict us to new living and so God in as much as we thank you for this day and for this assembly we pray that this weekend is more than just an assembly but instead a new calling a new way of life a reset a refresh a redirection that we may better tune our hearts and minds to yours And so, yes, oh God, be among us, but better yet, may we be among you, following where you lead, offering always words of love and grace, and showing the world what it means to be your child. And so, God, bless us, we pray, and hear us in the name of the one who has taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you for that lovely anthem. Uh, I have the unenviable task of introducing a man who needs no introduction, um, but it is a, a blessing and honor to have Bishop Reverend Dr. William Barber II uh, to preach with us this morning. And I'm well aware that you came to hear him and not me, so I'm not going to do an extended introduction. Uh, but uh, we are graced by uh, his presence as the president uh, and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach, uh, and also blessed by Yara Allen, who has traveled with Dr. Barber uh, and who will be uh, sharing a ministry of music with us before Dr. Barber preaches. So let us welcome Yara Allen. Good morning, good morning. My heart is already happy for what I've just experienced, even if from the back. It's very happy right now. And, and one thing that really made me super happy was hearing you all sing along. So you see where I'm going, right? <laughs> you already see where I'm going. So we're going to do a song this morning that was born in Western North Carolina. We've been singing it for so long now. If you happen to have heard it, then you can help the person next to you. Um, and this song was born in Stokes County, North Carolina, around a fight against coal ash. Um, people were dying, short story. People were dying. People were suffering physically, emotionally, mentally. And we listened to these stories one night at a town hall meeting. And this song came out of those testimonies, and it came out of our righteous anger and our need to open up our mouths and say something. And not just say something, but opening our mouths in the form of doing something, right? And so the song goes like this, and this is choir rehearsal, and then I'm gonna ask that when we sing it, we stand together, and our motto is that we stand together because we stand together. We also talk a lot about what, it, what I felt in here, which is that collective effervescence, that energy that happens when we all sing together, right? Okay, so here's the choir rehearsal version. Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you it's gone on far too long. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. That's the whole song right there. That is it. I'm going to ask that you stand, and we're going to get it going with a little rhythm. Don't take me too fast, I just had a birthday. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. Oh, oh somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. Now keep clapping, and what I'm going to do is take it up just a little bit, because that's where the energy lives. Right. Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. Oh, oh, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on. And we Did you hear somebody's hurting my sister, and it's gone on? Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on. Yes, somebody's hurting my sister. 
master, and it's gone on, and we won't be silent anymore. Did you know somebody's hurting our children, and it's gone on? Yes, it's gone on. I tell you, it's gone on. Oh, somebody's hurting our children, and it's gone on. And we Did they tell you somebody's taking our health care and it's gone on? Yes, it's gone on. I tell you it's gone on. Oh, somebody's taking our health care and it's gone on. And we Did you know somebody's poisoning the water and it's gone on? Yes, it's gone on. I tell you, it's gone on. Oh, somebody's poisoning the water and it's gone on. And we won't be silent anymore. Can we do one more? Did you hear somebody's hurting our families and it's gone on? Yes, it's gone on. I tell you, it's gone on. And it's gone on, and we won't be silent. Now let me hear you do the verse. Somebody's hurting our families together. Far too long. Far too long. Far too long. He's hurting our families. Far too long, and we won't be silent Amen. While you're standing, while you're standing, why don't you go on and just give God a praise? Amen. Gracious. Mm. Sound a little Pentecostal in here now. Huh? Somebody, there's some disciples around here. Amen. Amen. Just elbow to elbow each person as we touch and agree. Gracious God, we thank you so much for your grace, your glory, that um, you give us a consciousness to know when some things have gone on far too long and you give us power to challenge them. Now God, bless this church. Keep your hands upon this pastor. Bless our general minister and president and all those who serve. And Lord, if you would, when you call ministers to preach, you take the, tra the, tra the risk of putting treasure in trash, <clears throat> treasure in an earthen vessel, that the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. 
So if you would, hide me behind the cross, cover me in your blood, fill me with your spirit one more time. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. Come, Holy Spirit, come with preaching, hearing, and teaching power. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's good to be at Beargrass. It's good to be in General Assembly. It's good to see all of you. I'm looking forward to tomorrow, I believe, uh, sitting hopefully with Governor Bashir and some members of the poor and low wealth community in Kentucky, um, uh, Terry Owens and his family is here with us this morning. And I have to give a shout out to Miss Ali, uh, who has come to be in this space with us. And I don't think we have yet fully understood, understood what Muhammad Ali did for us as a world. Amen. And she's in this place. Amen. Where is she? My, where is she? There's blessings to you. Thank you for what you did in his latter days. You know, because a lot of folk are with you when things are well. But you were there when he slowed down, but his mind was strong, and we will owe you a debt forever for taking care of him. Amen. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4 in the Message Bible says, When Jesus got the word that John had been arrested, he returned to Galilee, he moved from his hometown, the ghetto of Nazareth, to the lakeside village of Capernaum, nestled at the base of the Zebulun and Naphtali hills. This move completed Isaiah's revelation. This Isaiah prophesied revelation came to life in Galilee the moment Jesus started preaching. He picked up where John left off. Change your life because God's kingdom is here. Now walking along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, later called Peter and Andrew. They were fishing, throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. Jesus said to them, come with me, and I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. <laughs> they didn't ask questions, <laughs> but they simply dropped their nets and followed him. A short distance down the beach, they came upon another pair of brothers, James and John, Zebedee's sons. These two were sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their fish nets. Jesus made the same offer, come with me. And they were just as quick to abandon the boat and their father. From there, he went all over Galilee with them. He used the synagogues for meeting places and taught the people the truth of God's God's kingdom was his theme, that beginning right now, they were under the God's, God's basileus, God's kingdom, a good government right now. He also healed people of their distresses and of the bad effects of their bad lives. Word got around the entire Roman province of Syria. People brought anybody, somebody say anybody with a sickness, whether mental, emotional, or physical, Jesus healed them, one and all. More and more people came, the momentum gathered. Y'all do know I'm passing a lot of preaching material right here. <laughs> <laughs> then Luke chapter six says, Verse 17, coming down off the mountain with them, he stood on a plain surrounded by disciples. He was soon joined by a huge congregation from all over Judea and Jerusalem, even from the seaside. They had come to hear him and to be cured of their disease. This is in Luke's gospel. 
those disturbed by evil spirits were healed. Everyone was trying to touch him. So much energy surging from him, so many people healed. And then he spoke, you're blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. You're blessed when you're ravishly hungry. Then you're ready for the messianic, messianic meal. You're blessed when the tears flow freely and joy comes with the morning. Count yourself blessed every time, every time someone cuts you down or throws you out, every time somebody spears or blackens, smears or blackens your name to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is so close for comfort and that the person is uncomfortable. You can be glad when it happens to you. Skip like a lamb if you like, for even though they don't like you, all heaven applauds you. And then after that night of prayer, he chose 12, 12 disciples, Matthew, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, James, John, the other James, Peter, and even Judas, who would betray him. From these two passages of scripture, I want to suggest the theme, we are called to be a challenge to the challenges of this life, this world, and this culture. Would you just look at somebody and say, we are called, we are called to be a challenge, be a challenge. To, the to the challenges of this life, of this, life this, world, this world, and this culture. Now, I'm kind of like a Boeing 777. <laughs> I have to taxi a while, so walk with me. I, I'm, I'm not, I ain't no prop plane. I don't just. <laughs> Several years ago, I had a marvelous conversation with a member of the church I used to pastor that I just retired after 30 years. And I asked her, Sister Felicia, she's a great vocalist. If you've ever heard her, uh, she, like Yara, can make you, your socks come off while your shoes are still on your feet. <laughs> and Felicia has a favorite song called, For Every Mountain, I Give You Praise. She sings it with such power and such anointing and such personal openness. She loses herself. She and I said, why, why do you do that with that song? And she responded by talking about her mother and father and what she saw through their lives in Arkansas. How they were college trained in the South in a time when few African Americans were able to obtain formal education. They were in the midst of the challenges of public education and their lives would eventually show them that they had been called by God to challenge the challenges of this life, this world, this culture, the challenges of sin and social injustice and racial segregation. They didn't get the headlines like Little Rock, but her parents were called and she saw what they went through and they never stopped accepting the call. And she said, Pastor, that's what makes me sing for every mountain. I give you praise. This week, Bill, I re-watched the movie One Night in Miami. If y'all don't know this, Bill Lee watches movie 10 times, the same movie. <laughs> and I do too. Because I watch it, I don't want to ruin it for you, but I watch and watch and watch because I'm listening for nuggets and points. And it's more than a movie one night in Miami. Regina Bell portrays 
how in a small hotel room on the black side of town, the night of February 24th, 1964, four young black men, less than 25 years of age, one of them Muhammad, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown, Malcolm X, were trying to understand their purpose, why they were born, why they had all these gifts, what they were called to do. Two of them, Sam Cooke and Malcolm X, didn't live another two years. But before dying, both of them and the other two came to believe that they were called to challenge the challenges of racism and justice so much so that before Sam Cooke was murdered, he sung a song, A Change Will Come. We often know the stories of people who challenged the challenges in history, but we don't always remember how they were called. Do you know the backstory of Rosa Parks? A woman of God, a seamstress, a secretary of the NAACP in Montgomery for 14 years before she refused to give up her seat on a bus and said no to Jim Crow in December of 1955, but before that, she was an undercover investigator of cases where black women were raped. Rosa Parks would travel to the South and pass for white in order to uncover what had happened to her black sisters. But 68 years ago this month, she was called because a young black boy from Chicago who had relatives in Mississippi was murdered and some folk claimed he had whistled at a white woman and threatened her with the whistle so on August 28th, 1955, they killed him, beat him, shot him, castrated him, and threw him in the river with a 75-pound cotton gin around his neck. How he was found is complicated, but once he was found, his mother, Mamie, who had not been involved in social justice, found herself called and she had an open casket funeral. She said, everybody's gonna see what racism ultimately does. She went on a tour calling people to get involved and Rosa Parks saw the pictures, heard the story, and she felt called. She had two white women in Montgomery who were supporters of justice to send her to Highlander in the hills of Tennessee right across the border of Kentucky. Highlander was the same folk school where another woman, Florence Reese from Kentucky, connected with the movement. At age 12, Reese wrote a song, Which Side Are You On?, that has now become an anthem in the Black Lives Matter, but it was first a song written by a white coal miner's wife. And when the sheriff came to arrest him with the mine bosses, she felt called to stand up in his face and say, which side are you on, my brother? Which side are you on? Rosa Parks went up to Tennessee. She went to Highlander. She learned the tactics of nonviolence. And December 1st, she sat down and the movement stood up. She said, in essence, I feel called that if you take one of our sons by murder, I'm going to take down your whole system of racial injustice. And because she accepted her calling, the modern day civil rights movement would and could stand up. Finally, do you know the story of Valentine's Day before it was commercialized to sell all this chocolate that we don't need to eat anyway? By the way, brothers, this is for free. If you don't get your wife nothing until Valentine's Day, you're a pitiful lover, brother. <laughs> and all the sisters said, <laughs> but the truth, <laughs> the truth about Valentine's Day, it was about a person being called to live out life in a way that challenged, the cha that challenged the challenges of life and the world and the culture of his time. St. Valentine, known as St. Valentine of Rome, was a priest in Rome. And while under 
house arrest of Judge Asterius, he was discussing faith with him, and the judge messed around and started believing in God because the judge said to Valentine, if you pray for my daughter and she's healed, I'll believe in your God. So St. Valentine prayed to God, laid hands on her, her vision was restored, and the judge gave his life to God, tore down all the idols around his house, and began to fast for three days, and then went un underwent the Christian sacrament of baptism. But because the judge obeyed, and fasted and prayed, and he freed all the Christian inmates under his authority. His family, 44 members of his household, got baptized. But Valentine was later arrested and con for continuing to accept the call to evangelize even his enemies. Claudius condemned Valentine to death commanding that Valentine either renounce his faith or he would be beaten with clubs and beheaded. Valentine refused and declared, when you're called by Jesus, there is no turning back. The world is changed. When people are clear about who we are and why we are called and what we're called to do in life is critical to life itself and worth the living. The two texts this morning is what began to happen after Jesus came to Capernaum and later in Luke, right after Jesus had declared the spirit of the Lord is upon me, to preach good news to the poor in Luke chapter 4. In Matthew's gospel, John was arrested. Jesus leaves the Judean wilderness. And in chapter 3, he had been tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. He's coming out of prayer and fasting. He comes out of the ghetto of Nazareth where he was raised. He announces that the kingdom is with us the kingdom of heaven, the call to grace, the call to mercy, the call to love, the call to truth, the call to salvation is with us and it being with us is a direct challenge to the kingdoms of this world. The kingdom of greed, the kingdom of meanness, the kingdom of lies, the kingdom of sin, the kingdom of hatred. And Jesus has been called by God the Father to challenge the way of the world and to redeem and to raise up and build a church who understood she was called. You see, the Bible is not just about what God will do. It's also about what we are called to do in Jesus' name. That's why I can sing gospel, but I can't just sing gospel. Because gospel is good, but so much gospel is about what God will do. But every now and then, I need a hymn to remind me <laughs> what I'm called to do. To be called in Jesus' name, it's about movement. We are called by the Spirit to be a movement. This is why Jesus didn't walk alone. He called disciples to join him, Pastor in ministry, sometimes dangerous ministry, to challenge the challenges of this world. And herein lies the first lesson of both these texts. God needs some called people. Things don't just happen in the world. Years ago, I was taught a poem, and it went something like this. There was a most important job that needed to be done and no reason not to do it, there was absolutely none. But in vital matters such as this, the thing you have to ask is who exactly will it be who will carry out the task? Anybody could have told you that everybody knew that this was something somebody would surely have to do. Nobody was willing, anybody had the ability, but nobody believed that it was their responsibility. It seemed to be a job that anybody could have done if anybody thought he was supposed to be the one. But 
But since everybody recognized that anybody could, everybody took for granted that somebody would, but nobody told anybody that we are aware of that he would be in charge of seeing it was taken care of and nobody took it on himself to follow through and to do what everybody thought somebody would do when what everybody needed so did not get done at all. Everybody was complaining that somebody dropped the, dropped the ball. Anybody then could see it was an awful crying shame and everybody looked around for somebody to blame. Somebody should have done the job and everybody should have, but in the end, nobody did what anybody could have. And this poem points to a truth. The Bible is glaringly clear that things of God in the earth don't get done without somebody recognizing the kingdom is among us and they accept their call. One of the most flawed theologies is to always ask God to do what God has called us to do. God does not do what we can do. Hmm? Now, God will do what we can't do, but true faith is never treating God like a divine bellhop <laughs> who we just send on an errand. God doesn't save us, anoint us, and redeem us to rest down here. If we rest down here, then what's heaven for? I was taught long ago, God doesn't allow us to go through life on a flowery bed of ease. God wants somebody to say, here am I, send me. Must Jesus bear this cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. And so, walking by the water, Jesus sees the, these soon-to-be disciples engaged in their everyday job, earning a living for themselves and their families, by fishing. Now to the unspiritual eye, they don't look like much. <laughs> they are probably at the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder. Their work is dirty, they smell, it's physically challenging, it demands their attention from sunup to sundown. They are the ones who would have been among the most oppressed, but remember this all the rest of the days of your life. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. In Matthew Gospel, after 40 days of night, fasting, temptation, John the Baptist is arrested. Jesus says, this is who I'm calling. So Jesus does not seem to be bothered by their grimy fingernails, their wet and dirty clothing, and not even by their low social status or their lack of power. He sees them. He sees in them the ones he needs to call to challenge the challenges of this life, this world, and this culture. Jesus did not call the qualified. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Rather, he qualifies the call. God uses ordinary somebodies. Now watch. Jesus, the one from glory, does not demand that they shower up first. Huh? He does not demand that they have to fit in with every tenet of theological exegesis first before they can join his mission. Nor does he ask them questions about their education, their ability, nor their availability for an extended time away from home. To Simon and Andrew, Jesus promises to expand their skills. These men who cast nets for fish will one day catch people instead. And for Zebedee, James, and John, they receive only a call. Just come with me. No hint about what follows. No details about the mission. No promise of success. And remarkably, all four of these people, just as they are, follow this stranger who interrupts their daily routine. And because they did, we are. In Luke's gospel, after almost being 
assassinated in Luke. You do know that when Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, healing to the brokenhearted, it says, and that day they tried to kill him. They tried to hang him, throw him off the hill because he expanded grace of God and said that by the anointing, God cares about the very one Caesar doesn't care about. Hmm? And after that, and after a night of prayer, Terry, he picks 12. And one preacher says, when you look at the crew he picked after a night of prayer, Is that the best God could do <laughs> after a night of prayer? Peter? James and John, who cursed between praises? Thomas and Judas, who would betray him? This is the best God can do? One preacher said, God must be up to something. <laughs> Whenever God calls folk like y'all. <laughs> God must be choosing us not so much for what we can do for God, but what God can get out of us when God uses us to God's glory. And this is another lesson. God calls the unlikely to the movement. Now notice, when he calls, he puts them right to work among the most vulnerable people. Listen to this now. He calls them and puts them right to work among the sick, pastor, the hurting, all the folk that Rome and Caesar didn't care about, the ones that Cicero called the dregs of the city. And the arrogant religious cultists would have just thrown away and would not allow them anywhere close to the holy of holies. He puts them to work, right to work in the movement, in the ministry, challenging the challenges of demons and desperation and oppression, the challenges of this world. The, the ones chosen are unlikely, and he puts them to work among the unlikely and the unwanted to challenge the challenges in this world. He doesn't say, okay, I called you, now let me put you in a pulpit. <laughs> he doesn't say, I call you, now let me put you on a church board. Before they get in those places, they have to go to work in the movement. And maybe, y'all gonna pray with me? Maybe this is why a Pew study recently showed that poverty justice didn't even register 1% of what was being preached in the American pulpit, even though it's 99% of what Jesus preached. <laughs> Maybe the reason why the Pew Foundation can report that poverty and love and overcoming injustice doesn't even register in our pulpits, not even 1%, is because we've sent people in who haven't been called who haven't embraced what it means to be a movement? Could it be that we haven't embraced what it means to be anointed and called in the way of the Spirit of the Lord? And you know what happens when we try to put people in pulpits and structure and bureaucracy to preach and to lead the church without first making sure they've been called and immersed in the movement of love, grace, and mercy? They mess it up. Notice, when they got called, they didn't get sent to a title. They got sent to the hedges and the highways and among the broken and those in need of healing. They were sent to challenge by their very presence and the word of the Lord in their mouth, the very system of injustice and cruelty and wrong. They were called into the movement first. They were born again first. They were changed first. They had to prove they would help somebody first. If you're not called to challenge the challenges of the world, then you might want the church to be a corporation and a club. 
because you don't have no smell on you. You don't have any dirt on you. You haven't been among the people that the Lord says go there first. John Compton once told me a long time ago, you can't challenge Rome if you're trying to be Rome. <laughs> Preach, Barbara. <clears throat> That's why the minute we turn the church into a clique of similarity or a hierarchy of high-minded heathens perpetrating the holy, or when we allow the leaders to be people seeking to have their feet washed rather than to be feet washers, to be served rather than to serve, to be leaders who are above the fray, who compromise with injustice and oppression rather than be a powerful community that challenges oppression. It is a grave sin committed by the church and judgment must begin first in the house of God. <laughs> Attending to our calling is to challenge the challenges of our world to be prophetic. And the church must decide right now. Most of the stuff that's coming out saying the truth of the matter is if the church is going to grow, if young people is gonna, are going to come, they're gonna, the church must be relevant. Have you ever read that text in Matthew 21 when, when Jesus goes into the temple, overturns the system, runs out the money changes? The next text says, and the children praise God. <laughs> they didn't have to get a clown. They didn't have to change the style of music. All they had to do was be a relevant church engaged in movement. The church, somebody shout the church, must decide are we truly called or, or are we just quarantined behind our bureaucracy? Do we want to be a corporation or are we going to be a countercultural movement for wholeness in a broken world? One of my professors, Bill Turner, professor of pneumatology, said, you can call your spiritual experience whatever you want, washed, dipped, baptized, sprinkled, slain, blood baptized, fire baptized, you can call it whatever you want. But if, what, after that experience, it doesn't produce a quarrel with the world's injustices and hate and wrong, then the claim of you having had a Christian experience is totally suspect. Uh, then there's a third thing. God will interrupt your schedule when he needs you to accept the call. Jesus simply said, come with me. Now we've heard it, you just follow me, but the message Bible says, I like that, come with me. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow learned this. He had just experienced heartache and death. His wife had just died. Been, died. He was hurting, he had a lot of death in his family. And Longfellow wrote a poem while thinking about how to make the best of life when God said, come with me. The only heal way you will get healing is to go deeper into the work of abolition. Deeper. A few weeks ago, my youngest son reminded me of this poem that Longfellow wrote about the moment that God calls us to come with him. The, the poem is called A Psalm of Life. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not the goal. Dust thou art, to dust thou returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us further than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, Still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, 
Be not like dumb driven cattle, but be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the pr living present, heart within and God overhead. Lives of great men and women all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing shall take heart again. So let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving and still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. God will change our calendar and God will call us to come with him. Sometimes at the moment of our greatest pain, the only healing is come with me. And God will call us to follow and make us trust that God will provide. Has anybody ever had to trust that God will provide? Now note in the text, all that is asked of them at this point is simply that they follow as they are, from where they are. Just come with me. Come with me. Things are urgent. When the Lord says, come with me, things are urgent. Rulers were on the throne, oppressing the people. The powerful were violating the love of God. Religious leaders were taking bribes and working to crucify love rather than follow. And in this moment, Jesus said, come with me. God calls us because there must be a confrontation and a challenge to the challenges of this world. Jesus says, come with me. If sickness is to be overturned and overcome, there must be a challenge. If your mind is depressed and you want to get, there must be a challenge. If racism is real, there must be a challenge. If hatred is alive, there must be a challenge to the challenges in this life and in this world and in this culture. In society, the crazy ways must be challenged. The lying ways must be challenged. The violent ways must be challenged. And we must offer another way. Your life and my life in God is supposed to be a holy confrontation with the things that challenge the way of God. We are called to be an incarnation of God's way. The kingdom is among us. We're called to be an incarnation of what it means to be holy, to be saved, to be faithful, to be full of the Holy Ghost is all about being called to challenge the challenges of this life, this world, and this culture. If somebody's going to stay in safety, they don't need to be anointed. If Beargrass Church is just going to be in Louisville and Nobody has to worry about that you are church here. You don't need to be anointed. Huh. If the disciples of Christ church is just going to be quiet in the midst of all this crazy, we don't need to be anointed. Huh. And don't you know, if you look around right now at the glaring realities of sin and injustice, I hear God saying, come with me. I hear God saying, I hear, I hear the question being asked that Bishop Tutu once asked in the middle of apartheid, who will join God? And don't you know when we see that poverty is the fourth leading cause of death before COVID? 800 people dying a day from poverty that is absolutely unnecessary, that doesn't have to exist. And don't you talk about, the, didn't Jesus say, the poor will be with you always. Read the whole text from Deuteronomy. The poor will be with you always because you are greedy and unjust and won't treat people right. Can't you hear? 
Can't you hear Jesus saying to the church, come with me, when 87 million people in this country are underinsured or uninsured in the wealthiest nation in the world? 25 countries are the wealthiest countries in the world, and America is the only one that doesn't provide some form of universal health care. Can't you hear God saying to the church, come with me, when over a million people died during COVID and we didn't even take a month to mourn them. Don't you hear Jesus saying, come with me, when we now know that poor people died at a rate three to five times higher during COVID, not because COVID discriminated, but because we discriminated in the way we delivered services to the poor. Don't you know? that when states like Mississippi and Alabama that did not expand health care, some families lost 21 and 30 and 40 members of their family within a 30 mile radius while the, while the state legislators in those states open their session praying to God and opening with the Bible and they don't know what's in the Bible and it's after they prayed to God, they then P-R-E-Y prayed on the people. Don't you hear God? When it just came out two weeks ago that 350,000 people died during COVID, not from COVID, but from the lack of health care. And we haven't repented a bit when over 50 million people work for less than a living wage. When we took service workers and changed their name to essential workers to force them to go to work, but then treated them like they were expendable because we said you're essential, but we're not going to give you a li living wage, time off, family leave, or health care. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. As long as right in this state, there's a senator in the United States Senator who I, I'm praying for now. He gets the best health care that he needs because he's a senator. He gets it free because he's a senator. I'm praying for him to be healed, but I'm praying when he gets up from his healing, he'll start supporting health care for all since he needs it now. Don't you hear God saying, come with me? Come with me. As long, as long, as long as sin, the sin of unholy culture wars and hate against immigrants and a nation of immigrants except for the former slave and the native people hate against gay people and trans people and women are perpetrated by governors who sit in church pews and never get challenged by the pulpit, who put their hands on Bibles and swear themselves in the office, but they don't even know the Bible says, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. Isaiah 10. Don't you hear the Lord saying, come with me. As long as racism is rampant. And I'm not talking about banning books, because how can you ban a book when the daggone book is online? <laughs> that ain't racism, that's stupidism. <laughs> and I'm not talking about saying slaves, black people, benefited skills from slavery. That's like saying Jewish people learned how to run ovens because Hitler murdered them using ovens. It's sick. It ain't racist. That's sick. Especially when DeSantis had two black so-called scholars write the critique on history. This ain't, this ain't, I'm not what I'm talking about. And I said, all my liberal white friends, don't run after those little, that's, those are red herrings. You want to deal with racism, you got to deal with policy. Policy. 
I'm racism, suppressing the right to vote, which is a gift from God, not a gift from the Constitution. Because in Hebrew, the same word for vote and the same word for voice is the same word, call. And God gave us the right to vote but when he gave us the right to choose. And so we only give the right to vote to people. We don't give it to pets and parakeets, only people 18 years old or, or, or brought into this country. So anytime you suppress the right to vote, it's more than racism, it's idolatry. It's a playing God. It's acting like you have a right to suppress my humanity. And that's what racism is. Racism ain't just the N-word. Racism is a system of policy where you decide who you're going to oppress and then you make race a reality in order to do the suppression. Racism trying to take all the policies people die for. Racism is blocking living wages and keeping 41% of African Americans poor because without, for without, without one, racism is denying health care. Racism is hurting the environment in a way that leaves 60% of black people, 60% of Latinos, 60% of native people in poverty and low wealth unnecessarily. That's what racism is. And when you hear this, can't you hear Jesus saying, come with me. These things cannot exist without a challenge from and by the church. But we take them up this week. And the issue is not even if we change it all. Bill Lee once said to me something I never forgot. We were, I think, at Hampton Institute. He said, Barbara, no, he didn't, Barbara. I don't even think God will hold us accountable if we don't succeed. But I think God will if we don't try. And isn't that what God said to Ezekiel? Stand up, Ezekiel. Speak the truth. You're dealing with a stiff-necked people. They may not listen, but at least they'll know there hath been a prophet among them. Isn't that what Francis of Assisi was saying? May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of God's creation so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and, and to turn their pain into joy. Did not Martin Luther King say the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who will remain neutral in the times of great moral conflict. And so we must decide, will we be a challenge to God or will we in God's name challenge the things that are unlike God? We can't just talk about what people did before us. I declare in the power of the Holy Spirit, our time is now. For Romans 14, 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but justice and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. If there was ever a time to be a movement for wholeness in a broken world, it's right now. <laughs> to live for the Lord, to come with him finally, requires a commitment of no matter what. You're going to get challenges to your commitment. When Jesus called these first disciples, he was calling them to a sacrificial way of life. And I don't know about you, I, I like these modern stuff, but I hardly can go in a church where there isn't a cross somewhere. Because I need to be reminded if I come with him, it leads down to Via Della Rosa. Hmm? Those first disciples for their part, they might have preferred to keep their jobs, to remain with their families, to stay with the life they knew. But when Jesus says, come with me, they make a decisive choice. They take a risk. They step out on faith. They say, I will follow him. No turning back.
And it really doesn't make any sense, y'all, as I close. Because there's just something about a call from Jesus. There's something about being tracked down by the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> there's something about when God gets your attention. I have a lot of folk coming to me and say, Reverend Bob, why don't you slow down? I say, Negro, shut up. I've been called. <laughs> there's something about when the truth says, come with me. There's something about the unction of the Holy Ghost. There's something about when God is trying to tell you something. There's something about when God says, I need somebody and I need you. Herod the Tetriarch was silencing and killing the prophets when they were called, but they came. Jesus was mocked by the devil and demagogues when they were called, but they came. And he says to the disciples, I know it's dangerous, but come with me. Because there's something about a call from God. There comes a time when we must decide. People must decide. Countries must decide. Churches must decide. Denomination must decide. There comes a time when the Lord calls us to step up. Hear me, Christian church. If we are to go all the way being a movement in a broken world, there's a cross in it. My beloved father told me when I first started preaching, he said, boy, you don't really know what it's like to be called till you got some blood on your preaching. And we can't be afraid of criticism when we open up our table to everybody. Expect somebody to say, we're too liberal. We're too loving. We're too lax. If we go all the way, we may go to jail. Paul did, Martin did, Emerson did. I've been 16 times and my arrest record reads, for emoting and praying too loud. Here it go. If you, if you accept the call, your life may get threatened. The power structure in the state and in the city and in the nation won't always welcome you. If you want to be welcome and be loved by the power structure, then join a club. Don't try to be a church. Because if you're a church that worships God and walking in the kingdom, every now and then, the structures of your city are not going to be happy that you're there. Because if you accept the call of love, truth, and justice, there's a cross in it. Touch your neighbor and say, there's a cross in it. Touch your neighbor and say, there's sacrifice in it. Come on, there's struggle in it. There's tears in it. There's hurt in it. There's loneliness in it. There's death in it. When we accept the call of the Spirit to challenge the challenges of this life and this culture and this world, we have work to do. Change does not come. It must be loved for and fought for and organized for and pushed for and struggled for. But I stop by to tell you, it's worth it. Because when the Lord calls you, it's something about how your idea about what matters changes. Because when God calls you, your eschatology changes. I feel like preaching now. Hey, God. Your outlook changes. Because when the Lord calls you, and you say, I've decided to follow Jesus, all that matters is seven words. Seven words no matter what you face. Seven words, no matter what you go through. Seven words, no matter how difficult things get. When Jesus calls you, y'all know Jesus, don't you? Uh, the writer says he never wrote a book, and yet perhaps all the libraries of the world could not haul all the books that have been written about him. He never wrote a song, and yet he's furnished the theme for more song than all the songwriters combined. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together cannot boast of having as many students. He never marshaled an army, nor drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, and yet no leader ever had more volunteers who have under his order made more rebels stack arms and surrender and not shot a fired a shot. He never practiced psychiatry, and yet he's healed more broken hearts than any doctor or psychiatrist has ever lived. Once each week, multitudes congregated at worshiping assemblies to pay homage and respect to him. Y'all know Jesus, don't you? 
The names of the past proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and gone. The names of past scientists and philosophers and theologians have come and gone. But the name of Jesus still lives. I wish I had a witness. You know him, don't you? He came down through 42 generations. He was born in Bethlehem's manger. He was raised in Nazareth's ghetto. He walked the dusty roads of Judea and Palestine. He healed and set free in Capernaum and Samaria. He lived in Bethany, the house of the poor. He washed feet in Jerusalem. He prayed in Gethsemane. He went to dinner in a sinner's house. And he spent three days in a barred tomb. Y'all know him, don't you? He called Herod a fox. He put Caesar in his place. He whipped oppressors out of the temple. He would not bow to the powers of injustice. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of our punishment was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Though time has spread 2,000 years between the people of this generation and the mockers of the crucifixion, he still lives. Do I have a witness? His name is Jesus. And when he calls you, all that matters is seven words. Pastor Owen, when he calls you, all that matters is seven words. Pastor Trey, when he calls you, all that matters is seven words. When he calls you bad grass, all that matters is seven words. When he calls you Christian church, all that matters is seven words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. When it's all over, when we're finished, when we've done our calling, all that matters is seven words. No, matter, no wonder the hymn writer said, if when you've given the best of your service, telling the world that the Savior has come, be not dismayed when men don't believe you. He'll understand and say when you're well done. If you tried and fail in your trying, hands sore and scarred from the work you've begun. Take up your cross and run quickly to meet him. He'll understand and say well done. When it's all over, seven words. When my life is over, seven words. I'm going to accept my calling because one day I want to hear seven words. Well done. Thou good and faithful, sir. Hallelujah. 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 Touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor, seven words. Seven words. And it's all worth it. Seven words. It's all right. Seven words. It'll be all right in the morning. Well done. Well done, well done. Don't you sit down, disciples. You stay on your feet. We're singing our way to the table. Don't you sit down. Amen. Well, we are called to the table. I want you to sing with me. What a message, Dr. Barber. Thank you. You're a blessing. Let's sing together. Here we are. You and me, I wonder if we're supposed to be here at this table. Draw us in, draw us in as I am. I hope that you 
Dr. Barbara, I was certainly moved by what you had to share with us today, but uh, I think you kind of got me in trouble here. I can just hear all our people rising up. Why can't you preach every week, Dr. Flowers? An hour. How much time you got there? Thank you for filling us with that challenge. And we come now to fulfill uh, that calling. We come now to this table, uh, not because we've been uh, challenged just to act, but we've been challenged to be God's people. We've been challenged to answer our call. We've been challenged to step up to be the church that is about that movement for wholeness in that fragmented world. All of that begins at this table. And it's an astounding and beautiful and gracious gift for God's people from far and wide to come and gather around this table together as one family. See, the world's out there all being impressed, bent over backwards, that Barbie and Oppenheimer can come together. But they ain't seen us yet. And they got nothing on us. Because if the world can bring them together, surely we can come together to answer the challenge. Not just from Dr. Barbara, the challenge from Jesus himself, the one who set this table for us. And so you're invited to come to this table. And more than that, you're invited to go from it changed to be more fully those disciples that we are all called to be. Let us pray. You tell us, Jesus, to do this in remembrance of you. And so we surround this holy, sacred space, red, brown, yellow, black, and white, LGBTQIA+, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N, BIPOC, Pacific Islanders, Korean, Asian, tall, short, big, little, D-O-C. God, we love you, and we thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. You gave your life so we could live. For this bread and for this cup, we come to this table to be fed, to be nurtured, to connect to you. We thank you for this church. We pray that as we leave this place, we infiltrate every part of this community this state, this country, and this world. God, we praise you and we worship you. Thank you for your love. Amen. As the song plays, uh, each and every one of you is invited, uh, not as a guest to our church, but as a guest at this table that has been set by the Lord that we all serve. As the music plays uh, row by row, you'll be uh, invited to come forward. There will be stations up front and halfway up the aisles as well. Uh, 
And at each station, uh, we'll share in communion by intention when you uh, rip a piece of bread off, dip it in the cup, and receive that blessing. And we also have stations up front if you uh, need individualized or gluten-free options as well. Uh, no matter how we take this meal, uh, what matters the most is how we come to it. And so you are invited to remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, and when he gathered with those whom he had called, those disciples, he took the loaf of bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he shared it with them. And threw them to each of you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup, it's the new promise, the new covenant, the new cup of hope and love poured out for what this world can be. Do it every time, every time you get together. Do this and do it in remembrance of me. Let us come meet the Lord at this table.
Amen. It's been a joy to be in worship with you this morning, and now we've come to uh, the time of our invitation to respond, sharing our gifts. We've been uh, uplifted in music, challenged and inspired by the proclamation of God's word, strengthened and sustained for the journey in and through communion. And it occurs to me that it's, it's pretty easy to sit in a group of, of Christians and, and clap and amen when someone with the gifts and talents of Dr. Barber proclaims God's word. But the challenge is now in how we will respond. Will we answer the call? Will we be open to using our voices, our time, our talents, our treasures to challenge the challengers of this world, this culture, this life. May it be so. I invite you in this time of offering, put that connection card in the plate and maybe that is symbolically, symbolically your way of saying, Lord, here am I. Or maybe you have a prayer concern or praise to share and that is your response. Or maybe you have a little something something in your pocket and you can share your tithes and offerings to support the mission and ministry of the Christian church, disciple of Christ, known in and through Beargrass. Know your offerings will be used for us to be and build the kingdom of God. I invite you to respond with grateful hearts. Never thought that you would ask first of all. I'd be the last one to call. How can it be? What do you want from me? Would you say we see eye to eye that I'm yours? And you are mine if it's true That I'm who you need Just say what you want from me You could turn heaven and earth all around Send Jericho's walls tumbling down When the storms are raging You can calm the sea But what do you want? from me here I am listening for your call answering I will go where you lead just say what you want from me you could turn head and earth all around send Jericho's walls tumbling down when the storms are raging you can calm the sea but what do you want from me I am so small and you could have it all so easily but still you choose me you could turn heaven and earth on a dime Change the ways that I wander for the rest of my life But listen now, I hear you answering So say what you want What do you want? What do you want from me? What do you want from me? I'm going to see if Dr. Flowers wants to say the benediction for us. Okay. Good My you. pal Trey. <laughs> we work together a long time, friends. It's a blessing to be back together. Um, and also want to say a special uh, welcome to Eleanor Barber as well, uh, Bishop Barber's grandmother, uh, mother, who is with us today. I'd gotten so much trouble just then. Bless you.
It's so grateful to have you here all the way from North Carolina. You did something right. Good job. Uh, uh, and as we go out from here, uh, can thank you uh, for worshiping with us today. Thank you to Dr. Barber for the challenging and prophetic message. Uh, to Andrea, to the choir, praise team, all of our amazing musicians, Willie and Bob. Uh, And uh, as you go out, I encourage you to uh, pass through the hallway here where there's a wonderful art exhibit on display uh, to further uh, reflect and, and discuss and motivate one another to join in partnership for this sacred work uh, that is before us. Uh, and I send us now on that journey with our closing benediction. May you go forth to live fully and freely leaving all your worries, your fears, your troubles behind, and take in their place faith and hope and love, for these are the great gifts from Christ to each and every one of you. Go in peace. Sing with us, church. Shadows all around me Starless is my and now that love has found me, yeah, I'm living in the light. A day and night shine a bright, bright light. Bright be the light of God. A day and night shine a bright, bright light. Bright be the light of God. I wait. sunshine when I look into your eyes. A day and night shine a bright, bright light. Bright be the light of God. A day and night shine a bright, bright light. Bright be the light of God. Let's go walking. We are walking.